portal pass some of the best war dogs in the world, and I'm proud of the honor to be among them. From kennels and from private owners, we came to serve with the Coast Guard. And although we dogs have been going to war since the days of ancient Egypt, I must confess I was homesick and nervous. As my crate was open for me to come out, I couldn't help wondering what kind of a dog's life it was going to be. Well, first thing they did was to have us processed, in pretty much the same manner as any 1A selectee. I had to be at least 24 inches high at the shoulder, a cinch for me. Some young punks too small to make it kept watching us, wishing they were bigger. I wasn't too worried about the weight requirement either, no less than 55 pounds. And I came within the age bracket too, from 14 months to three and a half years old. The small stuff hung around, hoping that somebody might start a kindergarten, I guess. Physical fitness was more important than a pedigree, just like with humans. But of course, we didn't get exemptions for dependents. Then what made us really feel like GIs was getting our own service numbers. In fact, we got the whole works including individual photographs for identification files. And every time the camera clicked, the small fry fretted with envy. There were some fine looking guys in my outfit, and gals too, like this one. Not bad, huh? I kept wondering if she'd noticed me. There was plenty of competition on the crew. One of the most important things was being assigned to our handlers. For from this moment on, our lives and our missions would blend us as one. As we walked back to our quarters, each of us prayed inwardly that we would make the grade, that we would not fail or disappoint these men whom we were to serve, that we would be worthy of the long, tiring, patience-demanding weeks of work they would give us. And so we met each other and became friends and tried to show that we considered one another to be the best of all. And a strong bond of confidence was cemented between us. No wonder the juveniles were jealous. We were more than mascots. We were going to be war dogs of the Coast Guard. At chow time, the handlers lined up to get our specially prepared rations. With our appetites sharpened, we were hungry enough to eat anything. But this chow smelled extra good, and it tasted even better. <laughs> Junior just drooled for some. They sure knew how to feed us. And I knew everything there was to learn about our care, our grooming, and our welfare. As experts instructed our handlers in every detail, drawing on their past experience and familiarity with dogs. But we had things to learn, too. In the basic training area, we were to be taught the first requirement of all war dogs. Simple obedience. Commands spoken with the accents of men from different sections of the country as they drilled dogs of different breeds and colors all dedicated to becoming indispensable assets to the Coast Guard for overseas duty. So they put us through the routine until we caught up, drilling into us things we never dreamed of in civilian life. Training us to the split-second obedience of every command. Our brains and brawn conditioned to coordination in combat until we mastered every phase of elementary training. By the time we were ready for advanced training, we obeyed only the commands of our own training. And when we were told to stay put, brother, we stayed, whether we wanted to or not. Every time we mastered a difficult part of our schooling, we could sense the satisfaction of our handlers that their efforts were bringing results. our muscles with canine calisthenics. After we learned how to take the hurdles, it was just another step until I was taking them alone and carrying a small object in my mouth for good measure. Pretty soon I was really tops at it. Wall scaling was another important part of our training and a 
canine had to be in fine condition, as well as determined to make it. Jumping over barbed wire wasn't fun if you didn't clear it, but learning to crawl under the stuff was even more rugged to prepare us for the tough, tangled terrain of the Pacific. An agitator had no soft job, as we learned to attack the forward thrust arm with lightning in our spring and all our power behind it when we bit the padded arm. Every useful tactic I learned to execute efficiently so as to make myself a valuable partner in any emergency where I could help. A vital part of our training included the use of live gunfire which accustomed us to the sound of weapons fired at close proximity. of many unfamiliar sounds and noises. Under simulated battle maneuvers, through smoke-filled terrain, we rushed the enemy with our handlers. Exploding dynamite in sham skirmishes keyed us to battle conditions. We had passed exacting requirements and were now qualified to perform a multitude of combat duties. Proudly, we passed in review. Now we were ready for active duty overseas, ready with our handlers to take our share of hardships without a whimper, ready to prove our worth under fire. As the ship stood out to sea, we proved to be good sailors. Salty dogs of the Coast Guard. It wasn't long after we arrived at our station in the Pacific before we were assigned to active duty, and I was eager for the chance to prove the value of our training as we received orders to go out on patrol and locate Jap snipers in the area. This was the chance for me to help where human eyesight might fail and sounds might be too light to be heard. This was where my sharp eyes and ears would be needed. Where my acute sense of smell and hearing would detect a jack no matter where he was hiding. As we followed the jungle-like trail, all my perceptions were sharpened to sort out every sight and sound and smell. To follow every trail that might lead to the enemy's concealed position. The further we penetrated, the more cautiously we moved. For in this theater, the Japs used the jungle's tangle like a weapon. A sniper could hide any place in here. The only way to get him was to go in and find him. And it was on one of these patrols that my training had to prove itself.